The female reproductive system is designed to produce an egg and protect and nourish a baby. The ovaries develop the gametes or eggs containing 23 chromosomes, which is half of what it takes to make a person. Once the egg is ejected from the ovary, it is then available for fertilization. If fertilized, it then implants into the lining of the uterus and develops into an embryo. Each of these steps have specific requirements in order to be successful, which are all timed and regulated through varying hormone levels. The main anatomical features of the female reproductive system are two ovaries, only one is seen in this image, two fallopian or uterine tubes, a single uterus, a number of ligaments that suspend the uterus, fallopian tubes, and ovaries in the pelvis, uterine pouches that are formed from the ligaments and the uterus, the vagina, external genital organs, and accessory glands. The ovaries are above and to the side of the uterus. They are suspended by ligaments which hold them in place within the pelvic cavity. The broad ligament is wide and flat and extends from the uterus to the ovary and to the abdominal pelvic wall. The ovarian li ligament, rope-like ligament, extends from the medial ovary to the uterus. Suspensory ligaments hold up the ovaries and fallopian tubes to the pelvic wall. The function of the ovary is to mature follicles within as the egg or ova develops. The ovaries are where the female gametes or ova are developed. All ova or eggs a female will ever have is in her ovaries from the time she was an embryo. The eggs are in a halted state of development until hormonal changes can bring them out each month after puberty. Each cycle involves the development of the eggs and the surrounding follicles until the follicle enlarges enough to be able to eject the egg out of the ovary during ovulation. Throughout the cycle, cells within the ovary produce a variety of hormones. Estrogens aid in the rebuilding of the lining of the uterus after menstruation, while progesterone promotes glandular secretions in the uterine lining in preparation for implantation of a fertilized egg. Inhibin with progesterone suppresses follicular development in the weeks after ovulation while relaxin reduces uterine contractions to aid implantation of a fertilized egg. The development of the follicles begin with the primordial follicles located at the perimeter of the ovary. These follicles have been there since before birth. They are an ovum or egg surrounded by a single layer of squamous cells. Follicle stimulating hormone from the pituitary gland stimulates the development of a few of these primordial follicles. Primary follicles emerge as a few primordial follicles move inward and form cuboidal cells surrounding the ovum. Estrogen, specifically estradiol, levels are increasing and facilitating the follicular development. As primary follicles enlarge, they become secondary follicles with the formation of a fluid-filled antrum. Secondary follicles become mature follicles as they enlarge further. Generally, only one of the secondary follicles becomes a mature or graphene follicle. The mature follicle moves towards the perimeter of the ovary as the antrum continues to fill with fluid. The ovum or egg remains the same size as when it began. The only development has been with the surrounding follicle and some meiosis stages within. With the aid of a luteinizing hormone surge from the anterior pituitary gland, the ovum or eggs is propelled out of the ovary and toward the uterine tube leading to the uterus. Once the egg has left the ovary, only the surrounding follicular cells remain. These cells enlarge to become the corpus luteum, which is a large mass within the ovary that secretes progesterone for 14 days. After 14 days, the corpus luteum shrivels up and stops producing progesterone. This marks the end of the ovarian cycle. Once the egg has been ejected from the ovary, it enters the uterine or fallopian tubes and travels to the uterus. There are two uterine tubes that extend laterally from the anterior superior region of the uterus. At the end of the uterine or fallopian tubes are finger-like projections called fimbriae. These fimbriae cup around the ovary but do not touch the ovary. When an egg is ejected from the ovary, the egg must propel across a gap to enter the uterine tube. The fimbriae help to direct the egg into the uterine tube like a catcher's mitt. The end of the uterine tube is the infundibulum. 
near the middle there is an area that is slightly enlarged called the ampulla. This is the most common site for fertilization. The end of the tube that connects to the uterus is the isthmus. This is a beautiful image from within the abdominal cavity at the moment that an egg ruptures from the ovary and is being ejected toward the uterine tube fimbriae. You can clearly see the gap and the leap of faith that that egg must do to get to the fallopian tube. In the event that a fertilized egg does not make it to the uterus for implantation but instead implants elsewhere, that is an ectopic pregnancy. Ectopic means out of place, which is anywhere but the uterus. The most common place for an ectopic pregnancy is within the uterine tubes. Another place is in the abdominal cavity since there is a gap between the end of the fallopian tube and the ovary. If an egg is ejected out of the ovary and does not enter the uterine tube, it will end up in the abdominal cavity. In both cases, the fertilized egg embeds into the wall and begins to develop. Only the uterus has the unique ability for expansion as the baby grows. If the ectopic pregnancy is in the uterine tube, it will be very painful and will cause the tube to rupture if it is not removed. If the ectopic pregnancy is in the abdominal cavity, the embryo likely will not survive many weeks as there may not be adequate placental growth to maintain the developing embryo. There are eight ligaments that hold the uterus in place. The uterosacral ligaments connect the posterior surface of the uterus to the sacrum. There are two so they can attach on either side of the rectum. The round ligaments go from the anterior part of the uterus and down through the inguinal canal to the inner region of the external genitalia. The anterior ligament is a peritoneal fold that goes from the anterior part of the uterus over to the back of the bladder. This forms the vesicouterine pouch or anterior cul-de-sac. The posterior ligament is a sheet of peritoneum from the surface of the uterus to the rectum called the rectouterine pouch or posterior cul-de-sac of Douglas. The broad ligament also holds the uterus ovaries and uterine tubes. The uterus is not positioned straight up but rather tilted forward. This tilt makes the connection to the vagina closer to a right angle. The large mass of the uterus is the body, with the rounded anterior portion referred to as the fundus. The cervix is the inferior portion of the uterus that has an internal opening called the internal os and an outer opening into the vagina called the external os. The uterus is made up of three distinct layers. The outer protective covering is the serous coat or perimetrium. The bulk of the thick walls is the myometrium made of three layers of smooth muscle. The innermost layer is the endometrium. It is a specialized mucous membrane that changes due to hormonal influences throughout a cycle. Estrogen promotes the building of the endometrium, while progesterone increases secretions of the nutrients from the endometrium. Menstruation is the removal of the endometrial lining by a sudden drop in hormone levels causing the endometrium to detach. This allows each cycle to rebuild an entirely new endometrium in anticipation of a fertilized egg implantation. The histology of the endometrium changes with each phase. Week one of the uterine cycle begins with the removal of the endometrium during menstruation. I know this seems like it should be the last phase, but it is considered to be week one based on what is going on in the ovaries where new eggs are being formed during this time. The weeks following menstruation is about rebuilding the endometrium. This is driven by estrogen and is called the proliferative phase. Finally, the endometrium is built and completed with glands that secrete a glycogen-rich substance to nourish an implanted embryo. If no embryo implants, then hormones levels will drop, causing the endometrium to fall apart and the whole thing starts over again with the menstrual phase. The wall of the vagina is lined with folds or rugae and can enlarge to accommodate an erect penis or the passage of a baby, which is why it is also known as the birth canal. It is lined with mucous membranes that secrete acidic substances to prevent infection. The hymen is a fold of skin that partially blocks the entrance to the vagina. The hymen is ruptured initially with intercourse. It may have been previously ruptured due to physical activity. Hymen was the mythical Greek god of marriage. The external genital organs are referred to as the vulva. 
The space within is the vestibule, which is surrounded by skin folds. The inner skin fold is the labia minora, and the outer is the labia majora. There are two main pair of glands within this region, the greater vestibular glands, also known as Bartholin's glands, outside the vaginal entrance, and the lesser vestibular glands on either side of the urethral opening. The clitoris is a mass of erectile tissue that has a number of structural similarities to the penis. This is located in just under the anterior junction of the right and left labia minora. Mammary glands or breasts are located on top of the pectoralis major muscle. Within the breasts are lobes of glandular tissue. Each person has the same amount of breast glandular tissue, including men. However, it is the female hormonal changes during puberty, then again during pregnancy, that alter the glands to be able to produce milk. Each breast sits on a pectoral fat pad and contains varying amounts of fat, which is the primary determinant of breast size. Therefore, the lactation abilities of women's breasts are not determined by their size. Breasts are held in position by suspensory ligaments, while there is also an extensive network of lymph vessels and lymph nodes. Between glandular tissue and the breast and the nipple on the outer surface are lactiferous sinuses, which is where the milk ducts converge. Milk production is stimulated by prolactin from the anterior pituitary gland, while milk ejection is stimulated by oxytocin from the posterior pituitary gland. Estrogen and progesterone have influences on breast development throughout a regular cycle. In general, estrogen serves to promote growth, while progesterone tends to temper estrogenic effects. The balance of estrogen and progesterone are an important part of overall female health. The formation of estrogen and other sex steroids begins with cholesterol. Higher than normal estrogen levels can occur in men with increased fat accumulation. Aromatase is an enzyme found in fat that converts testosterone into estrogen. You can see how similar the two molecules are, so it is a very easy conversion. Increased estrogen levels can stimulate breast development, even in males. Again, this condition is often associated with the fat accumulation. Unfortunately, if the man loses weight, the breast tissue remains.